Good morning. Good to uh, have you with us as we look into God's Word again today. I'm so excited that last Sunday we were able to uh, have church in the, uh, the building. Mind you, we were down to 30% capacity of our building, uh, at least the room that we were in. And uh, But this Sunday we get to meet in our auditorium. It's all freshly carpeted and so forth. We're excited about that. But in the meantime, Sunday school still needs to be done here on uh, Facebook, YouTube, or the church website, whichever you're able to join us with, and we're, we're glad you're able to join us. Um, I have a little statistic here. It says, the Society of International Law in London states that during the last 4,000 years, there have only been 268 years of peace in spite of good peace treaties. Isn't that amazing? 4,000 years and only 268 of those 4,000 years are, have been in peace. In the last three centuries alone, there have been 286 wars on the continent of Europe. 286 wars in the last three centuries. That is amazing. How would you define peace? Hey, this is one of those times where I, I wish we were together. Actually, I wish we were together all the time to do these lessons, but this is where I'd want some feedback from you. But how would you define peace? You know, there, there are some people who thrive on conflict. I know there are, but I think most people on the in the world would like to have peace. I mean, you see, with you know, whenever they have those beauty pageants or something like that and the, the contestants get up to talk, what do they say? Oh, I want world peace. Well, um, but, but you know, it, it's, it's one of those things, and, and you know, I, I think that, that people who like to worry, have you ever met someone who likes to worry? You know, I think that people who like to worry are just worrying about how they can have peace. You know, peace is, is, is a, uh, a great thing, all right? And I read this little uh, uh, definition of peace, not out of a dictionary, but I, I, I did read this definition and I really like it. It says, safety consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. Safety is in the presence of God. That's great. You know, I looked up the word peace in our Bible, and it's found exactly 400 verses. Okay, it's actually down there 429 times because sometimes it's multiple times in, this, in the same verse. But there's 400 verses in the Bible that have the word peace in them. All but, there's 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and all but six books of the Old Testament contain the word peace. And amazingly enough, in the New Testament, there's only one book that doesn't contain the word peace. And that is the book of 1 John, which is all about uh, brotherly love and the themes are about holy living, so it, it all tends to go toward peace anyway. But that only in the book of 1 John, which is, which is only, what, five chapters long, is the word peace not in there, you know? We're going to look at, at a man um, shortly as, as, as we progress through this lesson, and he seemed to be consumed with having peace, but he tried to get it in all the wrong ways, and we're going we're gonna to look at him in, in just a moment. But I would like you to take your Bibles, please, if you will, and come with me to 2 Kings chapter 9, okay? 2 Kings in chapter 9. I'm just going to start in the first couple of verses. And it says, And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Now this, it talks about this Jehu and it says that he's the son of Jehoshaphat. I don't want you to get confused. This is not talking about the good king of Judah who was Jehoshaphat. It also calls him the son of Nimshi. Okay, that, that would be his, his Jehu's grandfather. And it's interesting when we see a, a, a previous uh, uh, passage there um, where, where Jehu was, was to be a, a, a like prophetic passage of talking about him. It, it doesn't refer to Jehoshaphat, but it refers to his grandfather as Nimshi. Now, I did mention last Sunday, as, as we looked at this, that um, originally when um, Elijah, not Elisha, okay, you have difficulty figuring out which one comes first. They come in alphabetical order, okay? <laughs> but uh, Elijah was when he, when he met with God, when he was in that cave, you know, when he saw the thunder and the lightning and the rocks coming down, and, and then God spoke to him in the still, small voice. He told Elijah 
to go and do, and he told him to do three things. And it seems clear. Well, let, let me read those verses for you. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19. I'll give you a second. You can flip over there. 1 Kings chapter 19, in, starting in verse 15 and 16, it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return to thy way, <coughs> excuse me, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou compassed, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, again, that's it's actually Jehu's grandfather, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it, it really seems, as we looked last week at Haziel, that Elijah only anointed Elisha and brought him on. And, and this, this was there, and, and these other two anointings seem to have got passed off to Elisha. All right, and as, as we saw last, last week with, with Haziel, he had no idea when, when, he, when Elisha was, was weeping and saying, you're gonna kill all, you're gonna burn all the strongholds and kill all the young men and rip up all the women and the children and do these. I'm not gonna do all that kind of stuff. I, I don't have any authority to do that. He did not know that he was going to be the next king. And possibly with Elisha telling him that, that put that thought in his mind, well, it may have been in the back of his mind, that lust for power all along, because seems the kind of guy that he was, but he didn't realize that was going to happen until after Elisha was there and told him this. We know that the next night he, he goes back and he tells the king, he says, well, Elisha says you're not going to die from this sickness. All right. He did not tell him that Elisha said he's not going to live. But, he, but And then the next day after that, um, Haziel took a wet cloth and put it over top of his master's face and he smothered him and he became that evil, wicked king. All right. Jehu also, it seems, he was not he was not anointed either because he did not know this was coming either. But it was it was told to Elijah, and it seems that Elijah passed that off to Elisha that you need to anoint Haziel as the king of Syria, which is really strange. He's the only king that we know of that that was anointed by a, a prophet from Israel for another kingdom other than Israel or Judah, and then he was told that he should go and 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 God revealed to him this is the time, okay to go and to anoint Jehu to become the king of Israel, all right? And Elisha passes that off to a younger man, another one of the sons of the prophets. And we'll, we'll see in a minute that um, part of that was probably because what had, what had to happen after he was anointed was this young prophet had to run, all right? And Elisha was now much older and, and not to say that God couldn't have helped him and, and then he could have run like Elijah did and beat uh, Ahab's chariot back back to the, the you know, when he, he, God can do anything, all right? But Elisha passes this off to this young man and he tells him, I want you to go and talk to Jehu and anoint him the king, all right? Now, <clears throat> Elisha passes this off, like I say, to, to the younger man, but he tells him in verse number three, as I just alluded to there, it says, then take the box of oil, back here in, in 2 Kings 9, then take the box of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel, then open the door and flee and tarry not. Now, there are some other things that he, that he must have told him. It just doesn't go into detail here, but it goes into detail in the next couple of verses as to more message that he was to pass on to Jehu and what Jehu was supposed to do. But he had to take him and 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 anoint him. But I want, I want you to see here what what, what it's saying here, okay, he, he goes there, let, let, me, let me just back up a little bit. So he goes in and he, and he finds that, that the, the captain is there, that he's there, okay, and in, in verse three, he, go, he goes, tells him what he's supposed to do, and the young man, verse four, says that he goes there and he finds Jehu, and he is with um, some other captains. Now, whether they're eating or whether they're just socializing or whether they're in some kind of a military command meeting, it doesn't tell us that, but the, the other captains, of this these army and and it seems like Jehu is is almost like the commander in chief of of the of the army kind of like um, um, the name escapes me here okay Joab was was for Saul Saul's army there okay but we we have here that here he was okay and he he goes in there and and he interrupts this meeting and he asks Jehu I have a special message for you okay and they get up. Jehu gets up and he takes him into a separate room and he tells him that God is, he breaks open that box and he pours it on his head and he tells him that he is going to be the king of Israel, okay? And it, 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 as we look here in verse number six, and it says, and he arose 
And he went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. Doesn't that kind of jump out at you as, as something that's, that seems rather strange? He calls them, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. This is not Judah. This is not where almost half the kings were good kings, okay? This is Israel. This is the northern kingdom. None of the kings were good. They were all evil and idol worshipers and so forth. And these people, it, it, as we see here, Ahab was the seventh king. So Jehosh, um, Jehoram, his son now, is the eighth king. There's eight kings, all right? Numerous, wasn't necessarily eight generations because, you see, one of them only, only reigned for seven days, okay? But there, there's many, many, many years have passed of these eight evil, vile kings that are into Baal worship and other, other idols worshiping and, and witchcraft, we're going to see that, and immorality that just abounds. And when the kingdoms first split, we know that, that uh, Jeroboam, he, he constructed two golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, and, and put them there right off the bat. As soon as the kingdom split up and he became the king, that, that's, that's where it was, it was based on. And yet... Here we are, many, many years, many, many generations of people later, eight kings later, and this one's this eighth king is just on his way out in another couple of days, all right? But eight kings later, and God still calls these people. He says, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord. They're still his people. He hasn't forgotten them. You know, the people may have turned against God, but God is always faithful. God made a promise to Abraham hundreds of years before, hundreds of years before. God made a promise to David, and God always keeps his promise. You know, I, I don't understand why some people can't get a grip on eternal security, and they think it is just something that is too good to be true, that to, to think that God would discard a believer if he fails one time and nobody is able to define what that one time is or what, what that is, that God would throw them away and yet he would be still call these people after generations of idol worshiping, after generations of immorality, after generations of just vileness against God, turning their back purposely against God to worship something other than him. Very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they based their whole northern kingdom on two other gods right off the bat. They both were golden calves. Why they picked a calf, I'm not sure. But that's what they had. Or maybe it was the only mold they had. I'm just kidding. All right, but he's, God still says these are my people because that's his promise. God's faithfulness is not governed by what we do. God's faithfulness is governed by who he is, all right? Not by what we do, but by who he is, all right? Is he going to punish? Is he going to chasten? Absolutely. What does Hebrews 12, 6 say? It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. He will chasten. He will correct. He will discipline. But you know what? He won't leave. He won't discard. Chasten, yes. Discard, never. Never. All right? We weren't going to talk about eternal security. We're talking about something else, but I just can't believe why people cannot grasp this, that this is who God is when he makes a promise that no man should be able to pluck them out of my hand. How can they think that something they could do by slipping up, by sinning, by willfully doing something wrong, that God would throw them away? That's not who God is, all right? And that's not what God has promised, all right? Take a look here in, in 2 Kings, back here and look in, in, in chapter 9 still, reading verse 7. We're going gonna to see that here's this, this young prophet. He goes on to tell Jehu what, he, what, what he's doing here. He says, And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel, Jezebel, for the whole house of Ahab shall perish. The whole thing is going to perish, all right? 
This and this was again, God made this promise before in 1 Kings chapter, we're not going to read them, but in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 21 to 23, he tells the exact same thing of what's going to happen. All right. Israel may have forgotten. Ahab's family may have forgotten what God said was going to happen to Ahab's family. But you know what? God never forgot. No, because God is faithful to keep all of his promises, both for punishment, ouch, and for covenant. God always keeps his promises. And he makes this, this promise that this is what's going to happen. And he goes into some great detail here. All right. And, and, and carry on here. Look at verse 9. It says, And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. Both of these kings, their whole families were wiped out. All right? No, no line. No line coming after them at all because God wiped them out. Jeroboam was the first one. That, he was the first king of, of the, of the uh, northern kingdom. And he, he's the one who caused them to, to worship the golden calves and so forth. And there's no, no heirs to him. All right? All of his sons died. All of, his, all of his children died before they could have um, other children or those children were killed. The line was cut off. The same with Baasha. And he, the promise here is Ahab's line is going to be nullified. None left. All right? Nobody coming through. All right? <clears throat> Why did God promise all of this destruction? Why did God want to wipe out Ahab's family? Was it because of the immorality of Jezebel? Was it talks about Jezebel's witchcrafts? It talks about Jezebel bringing Baal worship in there, and and his, her her puppet husband brought that in there, Ahab. Okay, and 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 so forth. Was it because of all of these evil, vile, wicked things that these kings did? No, it was very very specific. Look at verse seven. He says. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Jezebel had wiped out these, these guys, you know, and, and there was a, another prophet named Obadiah that took a bunch of these guys and held them by fifties in, in a cave and fed them. And she was persecuting them and, and, and having them killed. And you know what God says? The reason... The reason, we think it would the reason would be because they're worshiping Baal and so forth. And, and I'm sure that's part of it, but that's not what he says here. That's not what God says here in his word. He says the reason we're going to do this is because of what Ahab and his family, Jezebel, and what um, Jehoram here has allowed to happen to God's prophets. All right? To God's prophets. Avenging the prophets. How much does God really care about his prophets? It is pretty obvious. God cares a great deal about his prophets. How much does God really care about you, me, us? How much does God care? God cares greatly. I want you to see a couple of things about God here, though. All right? He gave them years to repent. That's Jezebel and Ahab and Jehoram and that whole family. He gave them years to to repent. That's God's long suffering and God's mercy. That's who he is. But when there was no change after many, many chances that God gave them through his mercy, through his long suffering, offering his grace to these people, and they were now time was up and they were going to see God, the holy judgment of God come down upon them because he is a righteous God. Yes, he's a loving God. And he is a merciful God. And he, and he shows us his grace. And, and he did that for these people for years. And they refused to turn to him. He said, all right. That's, I, I'm, he's not just a loving God. And that's it. It doesn't stop there. Okay, He is an absolutely loving God. He is love. All right, But he's holy above everything else. And his holy judgment, he is a righteous God. And the judgment was going to fall on these people. All right. And this, this, uh, this young prophet, he told him that. He said, you've got to go and you're going to wipe out Ahab and his family. And then he opens the door and he runs. Jehu comes out of that room and, and he's with, these, with his other men. And, and one of these, 
these captains that are there starts mocking this man. He says, who is this guy? We, this, this kid that comes in here, he's mad. We don't believe anything he has to say. You know, there's some other people that were, the world has called mad. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 21, they said, Jesus, he is beside himself. He hasn't got it, all right? In Mark chapter 11, verse 18, remember John the Baptist? It says this man has a devil. And that was Jesus quoting what other people had said about John the Baptist. Remember Paul? Just an insignificant little character in the New Testament. He wrote half of the books of the New Testament, and God used him in a great way. And you know what? They accused him in Acts chapter 26. It says, much learning has made you mad. Well, this young prophet wasn't mad. Young, young son of the prophet that Elisha chose and gave him that box of oil to go and anoint, Je uh, anoint Jehu. And Jehu stood up for that young man, and he says, you know who he is, all right? You know what his communication is, who this person is. And they, they pestered him and asked him, so what, what was the, what's the purpose? Why did he come? He says, he came to anoint me. I'm going to be the next king of Israel. You think there might be kind of a little bit uh, um, a weird feeling there as he's anoint like as he's announcing this to these captains. Are they going to turn on him, say this is treason, or, or what are they going to do? Well, they all went nuts. Great, this is awesome. And they laid down their coats for him to sit on, okay, and, and, and so forth. And, and what, what happens here, we, we see that he, he says, you know, we are going to go and we are going to wipe out Ahab's family. But we, we can't let word get to Jezreel before we get there, okay? It's, it's a surprise attack that they're going to do. And they take off, and, and Jehoram, we see here that, that he, he, was, he was back in Jezreel because he had, he was, um, he had been wounded in, in the battle with, with Syria and King Haziel and so forth, and he came back to, to, to recuperate somewhat from his injuries, and Jehu brings his company of guys that are in chariots and horses, and they're driving fast, okay, to come there. The watchman on top of the tower of Jezreel looks, and he can see a long way off. And he sees these people coming, all right? And what he does is he says, he, they, he tells the king what's happening, and the king says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to send out a messenger to, to find out what is, is going on here. And this guy's just on horseback, so we can ride faster than the, the chariots can go. And so he sends out the first horseman to, to find out what's going, to see if he can get the message, and he comes back because he's anxious to find out what happens here. And look at the message that he wants to find out. Verse number 17. Verse number 17, it says, And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu coming, and, sorry here, and, uh, the company of Jehu as he came, and he said, I see a company, and Jehoram, or Jehoram said, Take a horseman and send to meet him, and let him say, Is it peace? Jehoram, or Jehoram, same guy, what's he want? He wants peace. He says, Go find out, is it peace? He had been battling with Syria, and, and he had no suspicion as to what Jehu's real um, mission was at this point. He's wondering, is it, is it peace with Syria? Okay, And so what he does is he, he sends his horseman out, and, and the horseman gets there in verse number 18. It says, So there went one on horseback to meet him, to meet Jehu, and said, Thus saith the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? turn thee behind me. He says, get at the back of the line. And the horseman's just kind of looking around and he goes to the back of the line and he doesn't come back. And the watchman is on the tower and he looks and he says, well, he's not, he's not coming back. He's, he's joined them. So Joe Ram's looking and he goes, send another one. So the next horseman runs out and he goes there and he says the same thing. He says, is it peace? Jehu says, what have you got to do with peace? Get behind me. So the man, so he goes back in behind the watchman says, he's joined them too, he's not coming back. So Joram says, well, I don't know what's going on? So he says, get me a chariot. And Joram heads out to find out what is going on there and he meets up with Jehu, okay? And look at verse 22 here, it says, and it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu and he said, is it peace, Jehu? Is it peace, Jehu? He knew he was. And he answered, what peace? 
so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. Now, Joram is scared. And he turns and he sees what's happening and, and he turns to Ahaziah, who is also with him, the king of Judah, wicked king of Judah. The two of them were, were working together here. And he says, it is treason, okay? It's treachery here, all right? And he, and he turns to run like the guy that he really is. And as he is running away, Jehu takes his bow and he says that he pulls it back at full strength. This isn't like Ahab. Remember how Ahab died? I think it's, it's just kind of a funny story. Ahab's in his chariot. He's disguised. Nobody knows who he is. And one of the soldiers that they're, that they're fighting, it says that he takes his bow at a venture and he just shoots it. It's kind of like, I got one last arrow. I don't know. There's a crowd of guys. And he shoots the arrow and it finds its way, <laughs> using that kind of humorously because it's God guiding this thing. It finds its way through a, a joint in the harness. It's like he moves like this, and the, and the harness separates apart like that, and the arrow finds its way right through that little crack, and it kills him. Well, this isn't, this isn't per chance, okay? It wasn't per chance with Ahab either. This is Jehu, full strength, winds up his arrow, shoots right between the guy's shoulder blades, and the arrow comes right out of his heart. He dies instantly, and he drops dead. Jehu says, take him and throw him in that field over there. Guess what field it was? It was the field of Naboth, the vineyard of Naboth. Remember the vineyard that Ahab stole from Naboth and had him killed, had him charged with, with lies? Again, it was all Jezebel's idea, but he takes his body and just throws it there like it's a piece of junk or it's like you know, a, a dead bird on the side of the road and then somebody just kicks it off into the ditch or something like that. And here's this king. And we're just gonna kick him off into the ditch, just throw him there in Naboth's field, okay? In Naboth's field. We see here um, that, that as, as he does that, I'm just gonna skip down here, sorry, okay? But he is looking for Jehoram, what he wanted was peace, okay? But the way of sin can never bring peace. There's a verse in Isaiah chapter 57, and in Isaiah 57, the very last verse, verse 21 says, There is no peace, peace, saith my God, to the wicked. No peace, all right? After he kills Joram and they discard the body, they chase after Ahaziah, the wicked king of Judah, and they chase him down and they kill him as well. And, and he... Uh, gets wounded in the battle and he, and he goes off to another place and he, and he dies there. And in the meantime, word gets back to Jezebel as to what has happened here and her son is dead. This mother, this wicked, vile mother, what does she do because her son is dead and he's out in the field rotting? She gets all her makeup, paints of her face, she tires, puts, says that she tired her hair or her head, puts a tire on her head. I don't know, maybe she's some kind of NASCAR race fan, she's got this tire on her head. No, I'm just kidding. But she she gets all dolled up, all right, and she's up in a window, and, and she's there as as uh, as um, Jehu comes back into Jezreel, and she's just there with just that, I don't care who you are, look, just that arrogance about this woman. And she says, you are, you are gonna be just like Zimri. Zimri's the guy that I, re I referred to a little bit earlier that he killed the king to take over his, his spot, he was king for seven days. Things didn't go so well. He lit the palace on fire and he died and, and he stayed in there and burnt to death in the, in, the, in the palace after he lit it on fire. But she says, you're going to be just like Zimri. You know, your, your kingdom isn't going to stand, but there's a big difference. Zimri was doing it to become, to get that power, that lust for power for himself. Whereas Jehu was ordered by the prophet of God to do this, all right? And and so he comes in there, and as he comes in, to, in there, and, and Jezebel's up there, and, and she's saying, throwing all these threats at him from the window, Jehu says, who's on my side? And two or three, it says that these eunuchs, they're like chamberlains that, that had to take care of her, they stick their head out the window. And whatever they did, whether they waved and says, we're on your side, or, you know, giddy up, go get them, Jehu, or whatever. And Jehu says, throw her down. 
and they grab her and they pitch her out the window and she hits the wall on the way down a few times and blood splatters all over the, the horses and Jehu drives right over with his horse and his chariot and he goes and stops at the local Wendy's and has something to eat. Well, it's just go in to eat, all right? And as he is in there eating and drinking, it says, there's dogs outside eating Jezebel. And it was prophesied back there in 1 Kings where we went earlier where it talks about, and the dogs will eat Jezebel. And it even says where? By the wall in Jezreel, okay? And so there they are. And, and after, he's, after he's done his, he's eating, he thinks, well, you know what? She is the king's daughter. She's actually the queen, kind of the, the uh, um, she, she, is the, she is the queen, although her son is reigning as the king, the regent, okay? But he says, you better, better go get her and, and bury her. So they go outside to find her, and there's nothing left but her skull, which is licked clean. All the paint on her face, her hair, it's all gone. Nothing but her skull, her feet, and just the palms of her hands. Skin, fingers are all gone. Everything else is gone. Okay. Jehoram, or Joram, whichever you want to call him, both is, both is correct. Jehoram longed for peace. He sent two messengers and then he went himself for that peace. But God tells us in Isaiah 57 and verse 21, he says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. That little definition, I'd like to read that one for you again. It says, safety or peace consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. Safety consists not in the absence of danger. That's not where you're safe just because you're out of danger. No, safety is in the presence of God. Jesus put it an even better way. In John chapter 14 and verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why can real peace only come from God? Because he is the only one that can guarantee the final outcome. 100% lifetime guarantee can come from God. and He's the only one. That's why real peace can only come from him. You know, Ahab's family forgot, or at least set aside, the promise of destruction from God. But you know what? God never did. He never forgot. Because God always, always, always keeps his word. Safety consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. We are secure in God with his promises. Back to eternal security again. We are secure because Jesus says, no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. No man. We're secure. Our peace can come, but a peace can only come, real true peace can only come from God. Have a great day.